Welcome to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom and pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI clients, referrals, and strategic partners through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25media.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Mark Moeller is a restaurant consultant, operations expert, and turnaround specialist with deep expertise in the restaurant industry. He is the president and founder of The Recipe of Success, a nationally recognized consulting firm that has held the secret ingredient to creating some of the best restaurants, fast casual dining venues, cafes, bars, bakeries, and multifaceted catering and events businesses. The Recipe of Success specializes in bringing fresh ideas to launch new restaurant startups and turn around struggling or financially distressed operations. Mark provides a customized approach to solving the restaurant industry's most unique business challenges. He brings the best practices of corporate structure to new and growing independent concepts, providing clients with a fresh perspective and a hands-on approach. Mark, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? I am fantastic. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So uh, prior to the recipe of success, what was your experience in the restaurant industry? So I spent 18 years in corporate America. Um, everybody from Prime Management was a hotel company way back when I was 16 to 18 years old. Before that, I was with a startup um, restaurant uh, in Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey called uh, Noodle in the Haystack. And uh, I spent years with, with Roy Rogers. I was Cozy's original director of food operations. I was with the franchisee by the time Brothers Bagels and a myriad of other uh, restaurant chains. How did you break in? Uh, well, it's, I, I like to say it's my mother's fault. I uh, was getting ready to go to the biggest party of the year for a 15-year-old. And she picked up the phone and called me that morning and said, guess what, Mark? I need you to come to the restaurant. She was a director of housekeeping for a hotel over by the Primus Park Mall in New Jersey. And she said... You need to be here at four o'clock. Tell your father to go out and get you a black, black tie, white shirt, wear your black pants, black shoes. Be here at four. I said, Mom, I got a party to go to. Don't forget it. You know, I've been a model citizen for the last three months. She goes, Do you hear that? Hear me ask? Be here at four. Tell your father to do that. And we'll see you then. Make sure you have your ID. And from there, I've been in the restaurant business ever since. So, what did you do uh, in that first job? First job, I started off as a busboy. I went from busboy to server to bartender to banquet server. I was a prep cook. I was a dishwasher. I was um, a line cook for a short period of time. I did front desk operations and I did um, housekeeping. Since my mother was a director of housekeeping, everybody figured I just knew how to make a bed. Along the, along that path, were you kind of uh, creating kind of a vision in, in your head for what you thought was a good restaurant or were you just soaking everything in? I was just soaking everything in at that point in time. And it actually way, goes way back. So I'm, I'm one of six kids. My brother's 12 years younger than I am. When I was five years old, I used to go into the into the kitchen. And of course, in an Italian household, you walk in, only son, I got whatever I wanted. My bread dipped in the sauce. And very quickly, they said, you know what? They, if you're going to come in here and eat, you're going to come in here and cook. So I was shredding basil. I was stirring sauce. Uh, just taking part of it for you know, 10, 15 minutes of the clip. And apparently they liked your food. They did. There's so much so that when I got back from Johnson and Wales after my first semester, I was told by my mother, here's the ingredients for Easter Sunday dinner. Tell me what else you need. We'll get it. And it's all on you. <laughs> Very nice. What <laughs> is it about the restaurant industry that has been and is still appealing to you? you no, know, it, it, it's the people. It's doing things differently every single day. It's watching people both on the, the guest side and the team side just see a sense of satisfaction. Uh, the team side, especially when I can take somebody from an hourly employee and work their way up to being an assistant manager, to a general manager, to a district manager, uh, and eventually even to, to ownership, which I've done throughout my consulting career. You know, it's, it's the greatest feeling in the world. And seeing a guest come in and just be blown away by the services that the restaurant uh, has to offer and have a great experience, there's nothing better. 
a lot of people have told me one of the things they like about it is, you know, like, like you, you broke in as a as a bus boy, and then right. now now look at you. You know, it's a it's kind of a what have you done for me business, and you can anybody can work their way up. Oh, well, absolutely. It, it all depends on how dedicated you are, and you really can't listen. This business you can't think about it is work. It's not work. I've been in the restaurant business actually. Uh, next March would be forty years of the restaurant business. Okay, the first five years were rough, but I haven't worked a day in thirty five years. What? Sure. What? How do you view it? Well, it's listen. It's a challenge. It's something different every single day, and and I like to please people. I want them to leave the restaurant satisfied, blown away, have their expectations exceeded. You know, it's the innate cook in me. It's the innate uh, family man in me. It's I, I treat everybody as a guest, and that's what I impart as well on my on my clients. Is we treat people as guests. I tell I'm the first person, and I drive them crazy when we sit down and have a team meeting. For the, like when we're watching a restaurant, I, I tell them, I pray you never have a customer in here. And you watch everybody's face go white. Uh, well, how am I supposed to stay in business? How am I supposed to get, earn a paycheck? And then I go into to my spiel about wanting everybody to be with guests because we treat guests a lot better than we treat customers. So you you uh, had a, quite a background before the recipe of success, but now you've been running that for about 20 years. How did it come about? So I, I always fell into it. But even before I fell into it, let me go back even farther back. So in 1987, while I was attending Johnson & Wales up in Providence, somewhere along the way, I don't know if it was on a TV show or I read something um, about consulting. I said, well, that's a really an interesting idea. I think I want to do that someday. I went out to Barnes & Noble. I picked up four books on consulting. I read them cover to cover. And then I did that for every couple of years. I would read them. And I still have them. They happen to be downstairs in the storage area, but I still have those four books. I just knew that I wanted to get in consulting and I wanted to train and teach people above and beyond what I could do just in corporate America. So in 2000, as I was leaving the company I was working with, uh, and I was leaving because I was being promoted, but I had to move to Boston. I, couldn't, I had a young family. I couldn't move to Boston. So I, I took the severance package there. At the same time, a friend of mine gave me a call, and, and, he, and Steve said to me, hey, Mark, I need a little help with uh, some nuts and bolts operation stuff. Got some time you can help me? I said, perfect timing. I said, I'm leaving the company I'm with. My, uh, and I, I had my severance package, and I have uh, my um, then wife and I were having twins. So work a couple of days a week, collect my severance, be home for my wife and my, and my new twins. I said, what's better than that? I loved what I was doing. I absolutely loved it. So I started backfilling with smaller clients. Nearly 22 years later, I've opened up nearly 400 restaurants across the U.S., both my corporate and my consulting career. And I work with anywhere from three to five to eight restaurants at a time, depending on what it is that they're looking for. So he, he asked you to help him out. What, what kind of things did he ask you to do for him? So it was all nuts and, uh, nuts and bolts operations. So day to day, how do we fix the systems? How do we put structure into place? We need to develop training manuals, which I, I, was, I write for myself and for my, for my clients now. And then I had to teach that. I had to educate the owners how they can get out from behind the counter. One of the first things we did is we put a point of sale system in. They were all on paper tickets. On a Friday night, both brothers had to be behind the line working their, their butts off. One, one's making pizza, the other's putting expediting, sometimes taking, um, you know, working the cash register. All of a sudden, after a couple months of really getting into it, slowly but surely, they were no longer working Friday, Saturday nights behind the line. They actually, I, I made them sit on the other side of the counter. And what are you doing? They got it. Leave them, leave them be. And that's when they realized, wow, it's just some systems and structure in place. I, we, can do, we can do this. And they went on to open up four more restaurants. How did you uh, how did you end up getting new clients when you were really just kind of starting out helping a friend? So it, it ended up becoming word of mouth. But I, I mean, I, I developed a website. I developed my company name right away. Uh, actually, my company name was something completely different. Um, everybody, I was, it was Image Restaurant Consultants because I wanted everybody to fix their overall image. People thought I was an interior designer. I was getting calls left and right. And I'm like, no, that's not me. I got I to gotta figure it out. But my, my website, my domain name was always Recipe of Success. And after about a week of racking my brain, I looked out at my website and said, ah, there's a new name, the Recipe of Success. I went on and I trademarked it. And, um, you know, I, I, the website has always generated a lot of traffic for me, but it was really a lot of word of mouth. So I went from that pizzeria where I worked with them for three and a half years, went from there, went to the Pump Energy Food in New York. Actually, the same gentleman that brought me from uh, the, for the pizzeria brought me in into the, uh, the Pump Energy Food. Worked for them for two and a half years. We packaged them for sale. That restaurant is now called Dig um, in, in New York City, uh, based, and they have a few suburb locations. And then after that, it's just continue to backfill with clients. And 
it was a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, journey. So I'm sure as a consultant, you've seen uh, restaurateurs with all sorts of great ideas. I'm sure every, everybody has a great idea, but what are some of the most common stumbling blocks that, rest, that new restaurateurs face that maybe they hadn't thought of when they're getting started? Well, one of the first things is they never have enough money. They, they completely under, you know, under expect what, what they should be uh, spending uh, to build out their restaurant. And then we talk about pre-opening budget and we say, here's your pre-opening budget. Let, let's just call it a million dollars. Well, I only wanted to spend like $300,000 on the build out. I said, okay, well, because of the equipment, because of the design, because of the menu, that's not going to work. But there's a lot of other things that go into pre-opening expense. We have to buy food. We have to buy liquor, paper products. We have to train. We have to buy China. We have to hire employees. And the good list goes on and on and on. So very quickly, that 300000 all in could be a million dollars. So people really just under, under um, plan for the financial piece of it. And that's probably one of the greatest stumbling blocks. And then the other things are not having systems and structure. Not only how to hire people. People come in and say, I've been a server for the last 10 years. Great, you're hired. But wait, you didn't ask them any questions. Well, what questions am I supposed to ask? They say on paper that they can, they can do the job. What, am I, what, else, what else do I need to know? And they worked at a great restaurant. Well, how do you know they really worked there? Why don't we talk about what their strengths and their weaknesses are? Okay, what's, what about their availability? Oh, I didn't think about that. I worked for one, rest, one restaurant here in Westport, actually, many years ago. 260-seat restaurant inside and out. We opened up on a Thursday. On a Saturday, not one dishwasher showed up except for an 18-year-old kid who never washed a dish. And he was all by himself. It was his first job. 260 c restaurant. Wow. Nobody bothered to check the fact that the dishwashers don't work weekends. <laughs> wow. Do, I, do most new restaurateurs um, have a vision for the design, the interior design of the restaurant? Or is that something that you find yourself uh, really uh, adding to? So, well, we take a very active role in that, um, whether it's directly myself or with the designers that I, and the architects I work alongside of. They have a vision, they have an understanding of what they kind of want, they don't know how to execute it. And one of the most challenging things is trying to explain to them that, you know, you can't put up curtains if they're not A-rated. They have certain fire ratings that have to be in there. I want, you know, you know, I want to put the, the fireplace right next to, you know, combustible material. Well, you can't do that, but why not? So there's a lot of education that goes into that. And it's not just the design element of what you see. It's all the infrastructure of what you don't see. Teaching them what a floor sink is. Teaching them why you do a three-compartment sink. And then you need seven hand sinks on top of the dishwasher you have. So there's, there's just a huge education piece that we take a very active role in, uh, in the design elements. If you could, maybe give me an example that you're particularly proud of of a client of yours that was struggling. So one that was already open, maybe not a new one, that was struggling and the kinds of challenges they faced. And then how you guys, the recipe of success, helped turn things around. Oh, wow. Who's my favorite one? You know, I would say many years ago, I was somebody came to one of my seminars that I did. I do a lot of work with SCORE and the Women's Business Development Council and the, the local chambers. And he came and he said, I've heard about you. I want to learn more. He went through my seminar. It was about an hour and a half. And he goes, I think you need to come over and talk to me. So I did. It was a sandwich shop. He'd been around for about five years at that point, maybe four. And he said, can you do an analysis? I said, sure. So I went through my analysis process. And the, the funny thing is he'd never been in the restaurant business before, but all the pain points, all the things that restaurant tours miss, he nailed. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then there was a lot of things that he, there was no way that he was going to know that he just fell into a trap. So yeah, some of it was training, didn't have the greatest training program in place, had the bones of a great menu. Uh, he, he won number one chicken sandwich in Connecticut one year. So again, a lot of things going right for him. But he didn't understand the systems and the structure that needed to go into place. And really because he didn't know how to do that and then grow uh, in, in that single location. So we spent a um, good six months with him, developed new training programs, did portion control, cut back on his waste, consistency in his product. So every, meal, every bite was in the sandwich was exactly the same. Every salad had the same ingredients and looked exactly the same because there's something about consistency breeding that quality that you're really looking for. So that repetition that we were able to teach and put into place enables them to hire better people. And there was being better people that was just skilled at listening and following direction. We, we took people that were you know, babysitters 
and never had a real job in their life. He turned them into some of the best cashiers that work. And then he took his revenue from you know a million dollars to a million three, to a million five, to a million eight. Um, he was doing so much that he was getting ready to um, open multiple locations before COVID, COVID hit. You know, you mentioned you mentioned um, the interviewing process and your and your uh, your clients there maybe hiring people who have never worked in restaurants before. What kind of, a lot of those I'm sure are entry level type jobs. What kind of characteristics should a restaurant owner or a restaurant manager be looking for when you're hiring, you know, part-time hourly employees who maybe have no experience? You're looking for personality, right? You can't teach personality. I can't have a server or cashier, somebody that's guest uh, facing and have them walk up to the table going, yeah, my name is Mark, what do you want? You know, that kind of thing doesn't work. Right. And so you need somebody that is going to be a little effervescent, somebody that has a willingness and openness to listen to what you have to say. And so that you can then mold that individual. Listen, I can teach anybody to be a great server if they have a willingness to work and they want to listen. If they don't want to listen and they've got a gruff attitude, it's just not going to work. It doesn't matter how much experience they really have. So we get them to focus on the person more so than the experience. The experience we can teach, right? That, that can all come along, especially on the hourly level. On the management level, we look for the same qualities, but we look for some people that are strong leaders. We look for people that do have some work ethic and work experience because you want to make sure that that person can really, uh, especially in a new opening, work with the ebbs and flows. And when we look for experience, we look for like experience. So we just recently opened up a fast casual restaurant, and we had a lot of people that were full-serve uh, restaurant managers, general managers, apply for work. That's great. Great experience. Guest facing will be fine. But there's a different dynamic. There's a different way you run that business from being out front that a full service manager doesn't always get and vice versa. So you can't necessarily transfer one to the other. What are some, what are some of the differences between fast casual and full service that maybe a full service person wouldn't get? So fast casual is more about instant gratification. If I walk into a full service restaurant and I'm a guest, and you take, you know, it's half an hour for my appetizers to, to come out. You know what? You can bring me a drink. You can bring something for the kids. You can buy us some time. You can apologize. And we get, as long as you're touching the table and saying, I've got you, we know that we're okay. We go to a full-serve restaurant. How many people are really in a rush, right? Fast casual, quick serve. You're walking in. You might have a half an hour for dinner or lunch, right? You might have an hour, but you got to get in. You got to get out. You're going to drive over there. You got to deal with the parking issues. Whatever those challenges are. You want instant gratification. Full serve restaurant uh, managers aren't used to that. Yes, they're used to walking around the dining room, touching the tables, talking to people. But how often are they really serving? Um, ho- you know, hostessing, yes, but they're not jumping behind the line to cook f- to cook food, right? They're not running a cash register. They're not jumping behind the bar to push things along faster because they have a greater picture they have to look at. Fast casual, quick serve. I can be on the cash register as much as I don't, in, in, you know, kind of. I don't promote that. I'd much rather you be in a position where you can get off that, off and attend to something. I can keep an eye on everything that's going on. And as somebody walks by me, I can turn around and I, and I can say, hey, Sophia, go check on table you know, 27 or ticket number 111 seems to be running a little bit behind. Can we check on that? And then I can reach out to the gentleman while I'm walking, working behind the line and say, sir, we'll be right with you. I'm checking on your order right now. I see that visual. I can still work, take care of everybody else, and I'm taking care of that guest a little bit harder to do in a full serve restaurant in that kind of context. Sure. One of your specialties is concept design. If someone comes to you with an idea for their own restaurant, what kind of factors go into helping them design their, or build onto that concept? Well, the first place we start with anything is always the menu. What is your menu? What are you going to offer? Uh, because the, the menu will then tell you what your concept is going to be. It's going to tell me what kind of service you're going to offer. It's going to tell me what kind of equipment you need. It's going to tell me the kitchen size you need. Then it's going to turn around and tell me the dining room size that we're looking to do. And so that feeds into the type of real estate that I'm looking for, as well as looking for in what town, what area, where am I going to get the greatest return? So I use a local uh, reference. If I come to Westport, Connecticut, and I want to open up a full-serve restaurant, that's going to be a challenge. Five, six years ago, Westport was voted the sixth sleepiest town in all of Connecticut, which basically means by 8, 9 o'clock, town's folding up. Not a lot of people coming. So there's got to be something special that we draw drawn in. If I go into the next town over, it's a Fairfield, I've got a lot more activity. I've got a, a few universities over there. I've got a little bit more of a nightlife. I've got a younger crowd over there. I can stay open until 10, maybe 11 o'clock in some areas. 
So the menu is where it all starts. It's going to dictate everything that you absolutely have to do. In the past couple of years with COVID now being part of our lives, has your approach changed? And if so, how? It has not changed. I, I get, the only way it might have changed is the design elements have to be a little more flexible, right? Because they have to say, well, if we go to 50% capacity, how do I do that without looking like I am half empty, right? So I got to make people feel comfortable. Uh, I put maybe I put in a little bit more of a takeout, even on the full serve restaurants. But other than that, we're still doing the same thing. We're still taking great care of our guests. We're still putting out great food in a great environment. What's the best reason to hire a consultant if you want to open your own restaurant? Well, I mean, really, there's so many. If you don't have experience, you want to hire a consultant. Um, some people who have a lot of experience will hire a consultant just as a mentor or somebody to bounce ideas off. So it really depends on how successful you want to truly be and how much you can rely on the people that are around you. Uh, there's a lot of things that I do with people that I'll come in and I'll just be a mentor um, just to kind of have somebody to bounce those ideas off of. And other times, sometimes I just help them with hiring. So they can hire me or any consultant for niche. We don't have to do a full-blown opening or full-blown you know, uh, turnaround. There are opportunities that restaurateurs have that they know about. They can just say, look, I'm not really great at recipe creation. I don't need anything for upfront. So I got a perfect example of, of that. I've got a, a client over in Fairfield, uh, Connecticut, who is a, he's a chef and his partner is the front of the house. Chef didn't need me for anything except for making sure that he had the right equipment and it fit in the right spot, and I got him the best possible price. He has his recipes, he has his plating, he has everything he needs, his vendors, everything else. They needed the help on the, on the front end. They needed help with the bar program, their service style, their, the layout and design of the, of the front of the house to make sure they're meeting demand, as well as staying within health codes. So there's a myriad of reasons why, and it can be as small of a, of a project to full-blown, here's a piece of dirt mark, build me a restaurant. We are big fans of gratitude here and like to publicly acknowledge people who have been influential for you. Who are some people in the industry maybe that you respect and have looked to for advice and have learned from? So I, I would say early in my career, it was actually the gentleman I alluded to earlier who brought me over to, um, to the first pizzeria I that I consulted with. His name is Steve Cohen. He now runs a, um, a buying group for, for golf clubs on the food side of it. But he, was, he, knew, he knew what he knew, he knew and he knew what he didn't know. But he also it elevated me to a different standard. And it was not only him, but it was also, so Tim Nolan, Hank Kuth, again, a couple of local guys who just had this desire to make sure that everybody walks out with the greatest experience. But the other thing they do is they take a hard look at the numbers. So I was always a corporate guy. I always knew about numbers and having to stay really focused on them. And they really just took that to the next level. And they were entrepreneurs. So they opened up. Boston Market, and before that, they had Blockbuster Video. Successful in everything that they did. And it's because of the attention to detail that they put not only the people that they hired, which they were phenomenal on, they, they had the right people, they paid correctly, right? They, if you walked in saying, hey, I need X, they said, I'm going to give you X plus, I'm going to give you Y, but this is what I'm going to expect from you. So knowing what to expect out of a, out of a supervisor, out of a boss, is tremendous for anybody. And we listen, we all want discipline. We all want structure. We all, all want to know what's expected of us. So that trio was probably the most influ influential in in the big picture of, of my career. Hey, Mark, it's, I uh, appreciate your time today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Where can people find out more about the recipe of success? My best place to go is my website, www.recipeofsuccess.com. Okay, great. Hey, I appreciate your time, Mark. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.